Hello and welcome back. If you're joining us, we're reading Five Children and It by Edith Nesbitt. And today we're going to continue with chapter five, No Wings. If you remember last time when we left Anthea, Jane, uh, Robert and Cyril, they were stuck on the roof of the church as their wings had disappeared after the sun had set. So let's see how they get out of this mess. All right, here we go. Whether anyone cried or not, there was certainly an interval during which none of the party was quite itself. When they grew calmer, Anthea put her handkerchief in her pocket and her arm round Jane and said, It can't be for more than one night. We can signal with our handkerchiefs in the morning. They'll be dry then, and someone will come up and let us out. And find the siphon, said Cyril gloomily, and, and we shall be sent to prison for stealing. You said it wasn't stealing. You said you were sure it wasn't. Not sure now, said Cyril, shortly. Let's throw the thing away among the trees, said Robert. Then no one can do anything to us. Oh, yes, Cyril's laugh was not a light-hearted one. And hit some chap on the head and be murderers as well as... as the other thing. But we can't stay up here all night, said Jane. And I want my tea. You can't want your tea, said Robert. You've only just had your dinner. But I do want it, she said. Especially when you begin talking about stopping up here all night. Oh, Panther, I want to go home. I want to go home. Hush, hush, Anthea said. Don't, dear. It'll be all right somehow. Don't, don't. Let her cry, said Robert desperately. If she howls loud enough, someone may hear and come and let us out. And see the soda water thing, said Anthea swiftly. Robert, don't be a brute. Oh, Jane, do try to be a man. It's just the same for all of us. Jane did to try to be a man, and reduced her howls to sniffs. There was a pause, then Cyril said slowly, Look here, we must risk that siphon. I'll button it up inside my jacket. Perhaps no one else will notice it. You others keep well in front of me. There are lights in the clergyman's house. They've not gone to bed yet. We must yell as loud as ever we can. Now, all scream when I say three. Robert, you do the yell like a railway engine, and I'll do the cooey like fathers. The girls can do as they please. One, two, three! A fourfold yell rent the silent peace of the evening, and a maid at one of the vicarage windows paused with her hand on the blind cord. One, two, three! Another yell, piercing and complex, startled the owls and starlings to a flutter of feathers in the belfry below. The maid flew from the vicarage window and ran down the vicarage stairs and into the vicarage kitchen and fainted as soon as she explained to the man-servant and the cook and the cook's cousin that she'd seen a ghost. It was quite untrue, of course, but I suppose the girl's nerves were a little upset by all the yelling. One, two, three! The vicar was on his doorstep by this time, and there was no mistaking the yell that greeted him. Goodness me, he said to his wife. My dear! Someone's being murdered in the church. Give me my hat and a thick stick and tell Andrew to come after me. I expect it's the lunatic who stole the tongue. The children had seen the flash of light when the vicar opened his front door. They'd seen his dark form on his doorstep and they had paused for breath and also to see what he would do. When he turned back for his hat, Cyril said hastily, He thinks he only fancied he heard something. You don't half yell now. One, two, three. It was certainly a whole yell this time, and the vicar's wife flung her arms round her husband and screamed a feeble echo of it. You shan't go, she said. Not alone, old Jessie. The maid unfainted and came out of the kitchen. Send Andrew at once. There is a dangerous lunatic in the church and he must go immediately and catch him. I expect he will catch it too, said Jessie to herself as she went through the kitchen door. Here, Andrew, she said. There's someone screaming like mad in the church, and the missus says you're to go along and catch it. Not alone, I don't, said Andrew in low, firm tones. To his master, he merely said, Yes, sir. You heard those screams? Oh, I did think I noticed a sort of something, said Andrew. Well, come on then, said the vicar. My dear, I must go. He pushed her gently into the sitting room, banged the door and rushed out, dragging Andrew by the arm. A volley of yells greeted them. Then, as it died into silence, Andrew shouted, Hello! You there! Did you call? Yes! 
shouted four far away voices. They seem to be in the air, said the vicar. Very remarkable. Where are you? shouted Andrew, and Cyril replied in his deepest voice, very slow and loud. Church! Tower! Top! Come down then, said Andrew, and the same voice replied, Can't! Door locked! My goodness, said the vicar. Andrew, fetch the stable lantern. Perhaps it would be as well to fetch another man from the village. And the rest of the gang about, very likely. No, sir, if this here ain't a trap, well, may I never. There's Cook's cousin at the back door now. He's a keeper, sir, and he's used to dealing with vicious characters. And he's got his gun, sir. Hello there, shouted Cyril from the church tower. Come up and let us out. We're a coming, said Andrew. I'm going to get a policeman and a gun. Andrew, Andrew, said the vicar, that's not the truth. It's near enough, sir, for the likes of them. So Andrew fetched the lantern and the cook's cousin, and the vicar's wife begged them all to be very careful. They went across the churchyard. It was quite dark now, and as they went, they talked. The vicar was certain a lunatic was on the church tower, the one who'd written the mad letter and taken the cold tongue and other things. Andrew thought it was a trap. The cook's cousin alone was calm. Great cry, little bull, said he. Dangerous chaps is quieter. He was not at all afraid. But then, he had a gun. That was why he was asked to lead the way up the worn, steep, dark steps of the church tower. He did lead the way with the lantern in one hand and the gun in the other. Andrew went next. He pretended afterwards that this was because he was braver than his master, but really it was because he thought of traps and he did not like the idea of being behind the others for fear someone should come softly up behind him and catch hold of each of his legs in the dark. They went on and on and on, and round and round and round the little corkscrew staircase. Then, through the bell ringer's loft, where the bell ropes hung with soft furry ends like giant caterpillars, then up another stair into the belfry, where the big quiet bells are, and then on up a ladder with broad steps, and then up a little stone stair, and at the top of that there was a little door, and the door was bolted on the stair side. The cook's cousin, who was a gamekeeper, kicked at the door and said, Hello! You there! The children were holding on to each other on the other side of the door, and trembling with anxiousness, and very hoarse with their howls. They could hardly speak, but Cyril managed to reply huskily, Hello, you there. How did you get up there? It was no use saying we flew up, so Cyril said, We got up, and then we found the door was locked and we couldn't get down. Let us out, do. How many of you are there? asked the keeper. Only four, said Cyril. Are you armed? Are we what? I've got my gun handy, so you'd best not try any tricks, said the keeper. If we open the door, will you promise to come quietly down and no nonsense? Yes, oh yes, said all the children together. Bless me, said the vicar. Surely that was a female voice. Shall I open the door, sir, said the keeper. Andrew went down a few steps to leave room for the others, he said afterwards. Yes, said the vicar. Open the door. Remember, he said through the keyhole. We have come to release you. You will keep your promise to refrain from violence. How oh, this bolt do stick, said the keeper. Anyone would think it had not been drawn for half a year. As a matter of fact, it hadn't. When all the bolts were drawn, the keeper spoke deep-chested words through the keyhole. I don't open, said he, till you've gone over to the other side of the tower. And if one of you comes at me, now! And we'll leave it there for now, but don't go anywhere. I'll see you in just a minute for part two, and we'll see if they get out of this pickle. Thank you.